We're delighted today to be joined by John Doerr, the chair of the venture capital firm, Kleiner Perkins. Now, saying John is a successful venture capitalist is a bit like saying Steph Curry is a successful basketball player. It's an accurate statement, but it seriously under, uh, understates things. Uh, John has backed some of the most techno uh, successful technology firms ever, including Google, Amazon, Slack, Compaq, Sun Microsystems, Intuit, and the list goes on and on. Uh, John has also, in his spare time, just published a new book called Measure What Matters, in which he discusses the power of objectives and key results, also known as OKRs, uh, a tool that he's introduced to dozens of startups, many of which are now household names. So John, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Well, uh, Don, I'm thrilled to talk with you. I, I, I dare say you're quite an expert in this field. I've been taken by the papers you've written and look forward to our conversation. Oh, well, great, thank you. Well, so, you know, according to a recent survey, more than 90% of organizations use goals in one form or another. So many folks uh, watching these videos will be familiar with goals, but not necessarily with OKRs. It, you know, in a nutshell, what are OKRs and, and how in your assessment do they differ from more traditional, more common goal uh, approaches to goals? So OKRs stand for objectives and key results. And it's a deceptively simple goal setting system that was invented in the 1970s by uh, one of the greatest managers of his or any other era, uh, Dr. Andy Grove. Uh, Grove loved teaching, by the way. He felt that the role of a leader and a chief executive is to be a teacher. And, and he, Andy was building the preeminent microchip company. You know, in the semiconductor industry, thousands of people have to get lines that are a millionth of a meter wide exactly right or nothing works. And so uh, he, he was a, a kind of mentor of mine and he grabbed me one day and said, you know, John, it almost doesn't matter what you know. It's execution that's everything. And let me bring this back to OKRs. Andy Grove invented a system, a scalable system for execution where you write down what it is that you want to have accomplished. That's the objective. And then the key results, which are how you're going to get it done. What and how, objectives and key results. And this system that he invented uh, differed dramatically from the conventional goal setting systems of the days, which were management by objectives. Those systems tended to be annual, uh, retrospective, backward looking, uh, tied to goals, top down, hierarchical, and honestly, not very effective. Even Peter Drucker, one of the original proponents of those managements by objective systems, eventually soured on them. So Andy turned that system upside down in inventing these objectives and key results. And uh, to this day, Intel uh, uses them to great advantage. I worked uh, with and for Andy early in, in my career. And when I left Intel, I took literally his slide set, that, that way of setting goals, uh, to every organization that I worked with. Uh, most of them adopted them, not all of them. Everyone adapted them. That is, they uh, tailored them for their own culture and, and their own particular business needs. But uh, no organization has embraced them more fully than Google has. And it's, uh, it, it's affected more than what they do. It affects their culture, their language, uh, their aggressiveness, their willingness to stretch. I'll, I'll sum this up by saying that I, there, there, there are five real key advantages that accrue that, uh, to a user of OKRs. These are the payoffs. The first is you get exceptional focus. The second is, because these are transparent, you get a high degree of alignment, focus, alignment. The third thing you get is a, uh, an uncommon degree of commitment. Uh, these goals end up being a kind of social contract between everyone in the organization as, as they declare, I'm going to uh, go for this uh, key result that relate to these objectives. And then you can uh, uh, track the progress through the uh, course of days and weeks and months in the life of an organization. Uh, finally, at Intel, at Google, 
uh, these, this kind of a transparent goal system, which importantly is not tied to compensation. It, uh, you don't pay bonuses, people aren't promoted based on them. That, that allows you to uh, really uh, build a risk-taking culture where it's okay to stretch for something almost impossible to do and, and, and not quite make it, but still have a considerable accomplishment. Indeed, at, at Google, if you're achieving all of your goals, you're getting all greens as grades, uh, you, you probably weren't stretching far enough or, or hard enough. Now, th now, that's all a matter of management judgment, but, but those five payoffs, the focus, the alignment, the commitment, the tracking, and the stretching uh, are powerful. They don't come with most other goal systems. And uh, I, I like to remember them because they're just the facts, F-A-C-T-S. Terrific. Well, let me, if I could dig into a couple of elements that you mentioned there, John, around how OKRs uh, vary from the more traditional goal setting approaches. Uh, and one of them is this element of ambition. So, you know, the kind of conventional wisdom and goals, particularly as it's embodied in the uh, so-called smart goal setting, really focuses on having goals that are achievable and realistic. Uh, in your book, you talk a lot about the importance of ambition. Uh, how, how do you see the relationship between ambition and goals? So, uh, Larry Page put it best. Uh, he, he's, and, and he's probably the high priest of 10x goals. <laughs> uh, Larry said, I, I would much prefer that a team set a goal to go to Mars and know that if they fall short, they're still likely to achieve something extraordinary, like get to the moon. So uh, uh, the natural tendency, particularly when uh, goals are the basis of promotions or uh, bonuses, is to be conservative. And uh, even, even Jeff Bezos uh, deeply, deeply believed that the, the natural tendency as organizations grow is to grow more conservative, to grow more analytic. He called this the institutional no. And it was very important to, to Jeff that as Amazon grows, that they still be willing to do uh, bold, nearly unbelievable uh, uh, campaigns, initiatives. And uh, a, a lot of those will fail. The fundamental question is, is it okay to fail? Do you have a risk-taking culture? And that answer will vary by industry, by uh, structure of the market and, and the competition. I, I, for one, have wondered a lot about this as it relates to healthcare and hospital systems. I think running a hospital is one of the most difficult jobs in the world. It's enormous pressures, and lives are on the line, and thousands of people are making tens of thousands of decisions. Do we really want risk-taking in those institutions? Well, well I uh, recently talked about this work with uh, the CEO of one of the nation's absolutely most admired uh, uh, healthcare systems. And he said his number one goal as the new CEO of this system is to get them to embrace and adopt objectives and key results. That there are a whole host of dimensions in which he wants risk-taking and stretching. Uh, and, and then there's others in the parlance of Google where you must achieve 100% of the goal. 70% will not be good enough. And the wonderful engineers at, at Google decided not only to measure our accomplishments down to a tenth of a decimal point, <laughs> but to distinguish between aspirational goals, which would be stretch, and committed goals, where the expectation is 100% is what should be achieved. And John, what in your experience with the companies you've worked with, the uh, you know executives you've talked to, how how should companies think about that mix, right? Because the the challenge is the the hospital example you give is a terrific one, where there's some activities you really don't want doctors necessarily experimenting with. Does it work to wash my hands or not? That's really you know more of a, a tool Gwande checklist uh, uh, kind of thing. But in other cases, as the CEO you mentioned uh, talks about, there's a, a need for stretch, a need for um, for innovation. How you know how have you seen companies strike that balance well? How how do you think about uh, how executives and leaders should strike that balance. So I have a couple of thoughts. <clears throat> the first is that companies uh, 
are in different phases at different times, not just as they grow, but as their market conditions change. So the book says there's times when you need to really batten down the hatches and execute. Uh, perhaps you have some really uh, critical milestones to achieve before a financing of some sort. And then the goals are gonna tend to be less aspirational and more focused on how, how we must execute in the here and now. Uh, that, that's one thought. But the other larger view is OKRs are not a silver bullet. <laughs> they don't substitute at any point in time for uh, a, a strong culture or stronger management. I, I, I like to say that good business judgment uh, trumps this system. But, but when those fundamentals are in place, when you have a strong culture and stronger management, uh, this kind of goal system can take a team to the mountaintop. I've, I've seen it time and time again. Yeah, I'd like to stick on that point about not being a silver bullet. Every time I've heard you talk about OKRs, you've been super explicit about that point, that you know they're a power tool, but not a silver bullet, and their success depends on things like leadership and the culture. You know, as you think back about companies that have embraced OKRs and really harnessed their full potential, how, how would you, what are the other complementary attributes or traits that allowed them to make the most of the tool? Uh, and, and, or on the, on the other side, organizations that haven't, you know, kind of leveraged it to its full potential, what, what maybe have they been lacking? So here's, here's why they most often fail. Uh, and, and, and it's because the CEO or the leader of the function is not personally committed. How do we measure that commitment? Uh, does the CEO write down her objectives and key results every quarter? The personal ones, and are those different than the ones for the company overall? And will she stand up in front of the entire organization uh, every quarter in an all hands meeting and review their personal successes and failures? Uh, do they become part of the language, the, the rhythm of, 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 of the operation? Not just checked quarterly, but uh, used in uh, staff meetings and one-on-one -on -one meetings? Are, are they the basis on which the company communicates to the board? Not just financial statements, but these all important priorities. Remember, OKRs are not the sum of all tasks. They are the few things that we're trying to highlight and isolate uh, because they deserve special attention. Um, does the leader of the organization, and for that matter, the organization itself, have a system whereby they can cheer on the successes of colleagues and, and, and nudge others forward who are, are, are falling short. These kinds of social signals you can find in, in modern scalable uh, structured goal setting systems. And, and they're uh, super important. When you, uh, when you really get the organization living and breathing it, uh, this uh, doesn't become the soul of, 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 of the team but it's, um, it's the goalpost, it's the milestones. It, 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 it can be the game plan. Uh, there's a, a twin sister, if you will, for OKRs that I describe in the book called CFRs, which stands for conversations, feedback, and recognition. And so the goals clearly lay out what it is we wanna have accomplished. I think of those in the football analogy as uh, the objective is the goalposts, and the key results are the 10 yard markers as we march our way down the field. Uh, but equally important are the huddles and the plays that we're calling and the uh, feedback and course corrections along the way. Those are what CFRs are or in uh, HR speak, I think this is being referred to as continuous performance management as compared to uh, doing annual performance reviews. We're seeing more and more organizations. I think now something like 20% of the Fortune 500 are just ditching the annual performance review altogether in favor of more frequent feedback. And this is especially important with millennial workers who want constant feedback. They want to know how they fit in the big picture, uh, uh, but they don't want to be micromanaged. And so CFRs, OKRs are, are, are powerful tools to both engage and make the most of, of their ambition. 
Yeah, no, these are terrific points, especially this notion of embedding the OKRs in ongoing conversations around feedback, around uh, review, uh, and, and the importance of the transparency so that they're not, as you rightly note, framed as, you know, kind of individual performance management, an a, a individual sport. They're viewed as a, a team sport that collectively we're going to, uh, to uh, execute and, and, you know, move down the hashtags uh, to the goalposts. Um, I wonder, you know, another element that you mentioned, I think it's just going to be so surprising to folks that it'd be terrific if you could dig in a bit more. Uh, you, you know, a lot of companies, a lot of leaders pride themselves on pay for performance. So the notion is, you know, we're going to, uh, people are going to set their goals, they're going to achieve 100% of their goals. If they achieve 100% of their goals, you know, they'll get a big juicy carrot. And if they don't, they'll be hit with a, a, a big stick. And, you know, that's a point of pride. And, and it's deeply, deeply embedded in how a lot of managers think about motivation, about execution, about getting things done. You know, you, you in the book argue uh, very eloquently for an alternative approach. Uh, and, and could you just expand a little bit on that? How, you know, how that looks and feels in organizations? What, uh, you know, what do you think the risks are of the traditional approach, the benefits of the alternative approach? Just, it, it'd be really helpful, I think, for folks to hear your point of view on that. Sure. Thanks for asking. You, you know, just the simple decision to have all the goals in an organization be transparent is radical for most of American or worldwide business. Now, the notion that they'd be transparent and self-graded is a, a step further into <laughs> uncomfortable territory. And then the idea that we wouldn't tie these to bonuses is almost heretical. The, uh, but the data is really very clear. Uh, we know that uh, organizations and teams, individuals, achieve much higher performance when they have written and developed their own goals, when they own those, when those are transparent, and that uh, intrinsic motivations. Uh, I have an objective to be healthy. There's a big difference between my doctor telling me to run a marathon or me choosing to run the marathon. And we know in business, there's lots of right answers. So this decoupling of the objective from the key results, the what's from the how's, and having the individual contributors uh, find their own right answer uh, is powerful. It, it yields uh, much better results. Now, uh, I'm often asked the question, well, John, how about sales? we have quotas, we, we pay commissions. You, are you saying we shouldn't pay quotas? No, I'm not. Uh, indeed, a, a measure, a key result like revenues can live in an OKR system and also be the basis for a simple set of bonuses. But if you take the most important things in the company and you yoke those to bonus payments, uh, you'll find your organization grows risk averse, conservative, uh, you don't get uh, for several reasons that I've just described, uh, uh, operating excellence. Yeah, and just to underscore your point about intrinsic motivation, the, uh, the most recent research suggests for routine activities that people know how to do, about 60% of observed motivation is extrinsic and 40% is intrinsic. So it's almost 50-50, even for sales quota type things. Yep. To activities that require creativity, it's about 85% intrinsic motivation. And, you know, essentially for those kinds of activities, innovative activities, learning activities, uh, extrinsic motivation is almost rounding error. Yes. It's really not so critical. So maybe we could dig in a little bit more to the relationship between OKRs and, and culture. When, when you think about the organizations that have used OKRs really well, what would you say were the cultural attributes or values that allowed them to embrace and, and uh, you know, kind of harness the power of the tool? So let's talk about culture. First of all, I think about OKRs as transparent vessels that are shaped from uh, our ambitions. What's really crucial are the values that we pour into those vessels. OKRs answer the question, what it is I want to have accomplished, how I'm going to get it done. Values are expressed by the mission statement and the values statement. And they answer the fundamental question, why? Why it is that we do the work that we do. 
whether we're a for-profit or non-profit organization, powerful organizations have clear, actionable, long-lived uh, mission and value statement. I mean, look at some of them. Uh, let's just uh, uh, connect the whole world. That's Facebook. Or, or Google, organize all the world's information and make it readily available to anyone, anywhere, anytime. Uh, these mission statements, when uh, expressed by values statements, for example, the book has original values statements from Intel. We're gonna be aggressive introverts. We're going to confront problems, not people. We're gonna be system oriented in, in our solutions. We're gonna check our egos at the door when we go to meetings so that the best ideas win. Those sorts of value statements are especially important now. And, and, and I wanna share with you a passage from the book from Dove Seidemann, who said in the past, employees just needed to do the next thing right. In other words, follow orders exactly to the letter. And culture didn't matter so much. But now we're living, we're competing in a world where we're asking people to do the next right thing. Not the next thing right, but the next right thing. A rule book can tell you what you can or can't do, but it's culture that's gonna tell you what you should do. They say culture eats strategy for breakfast. And so cult culture is the way, you, the way we can uh, streamline, actually uh, take off the table for discussion thousands of decisions which uh, your culture will allow you to uh, uh, make quickly and correctly. Yeah, and, and I think it's so nice that you emphasize this point because really both OKRs and culture are mechanisms for providing guidance to people without micromanaging or as you talked about earlier, trying to dictate from the top or codify in, in rule books how you should do everything, which is, is just plausible for, uh, uh, you know, for large complex organizations. Um, you know, one, one thing I'd like to do is offer some context for this movement, for, 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 for this whole book, because I think, I think we are, in fact, at a really critical moment in time, a, a, a point in time where uh, our leaders and some, some of our great institutions are, are failing us. You ask the question, why? Well, in some cases, it's because they're bad or unethical, but too often it's because they've focused on the wrong objectives, leading us to totally unacceptable outcomes. Wells Fargo is an example of this, or Theranos. And this has got to stop in every walk of our life. How are we gonna fix this? How are we, how, how are we gonna get, get back on, on the right track? Well. In, in my work, I've been able to see very talented teams uh, choose the right objectives and the wrong objectives and, and to succeed and to fail. And so what's really crucial is how and why we set meaningful, audacious goals, how we set the right objectives for the right reasons. And the choice of these matters a lot. If you're Wells Fargo and you just set the goal as signing up new accounts. You'll, without any measure of quality, uh, you'll get what they've got. And so in every walk of our life, I believe OKRs can go well beyond our businesses to our nonprofits, our schools, uh, e even our governments, where accountability, transparency, uh, imagine if a city government used OKRs. You know, in the book you write about OKRs at uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, I've over the past couple of years worked with the global health bit of the Gates Foundation on executing their strategy. And, and one of the things that's really striking is the audacity of their goals and their impatience for results. So I, I, it'd be super if you could just talk a little bit about goal OKRs and how to use them outside of the business context. Sure. Uh, great, great question. And um exciting territory for me in a place where I'm uh, learning, learning lots. Uh, Bill Gates says in, in, in uh, the Gates case study that uh, too many nonprofits confuse their mission with their objectives. And, and, and therefore, they never get 
the right objectives or crisp measures for key results. And, and so I've been uh, really pleasantly surprised by the interest from the nonprofit advocacy sector. And, and this is uh, not just charitable organizations, but uh, political advocacy groups, causes uh, writ large. Uh, Bono ha has a warning in his case study that uh, it's important to not over institutionalize a cause or an advocacy organization. And it's, it's a reflection, it's an echo, I think, of Jeff Bezos' admonition that uh, we must be careful to avoid the institutional no. Uh, th these are no more than a, a, a set of tools, but the satisfaction that you get, especially for a mission-driven kind of cause of having your whole team alive, aligned it is, uh, is, it is powerful and missing, I think, from uh, too many nonprofits. Yeah, no, I agree. And the other thing I've seen with the Gates Foundation with their use of OKRs is one, uh, by making the goals explicit and as you talk about in the book, verifiable, it helps to coordinate an ecosystem of partners whose cooperation is crucial for uh, results. The other thing is it helps to take as, you know, their, their goals uh, eradicate malaria, take something that's uh, just, uh, uh, you know, kind of insanely ambitious and chunk it up in, into the, uh, you know, the 10 yard lines, as you talked about in your earlier metaphor. Uh, but so John, again, super conscious of your time and uh, don't want to impose, but thank you so much uh, again for uh, talking us through Measure What Matters. Uh, and beyond, of course, uh, your uh, New York Times bestselling book about OKRs and how they can change the world. Well, I've enjoyed this conversation immensely. And I, I really think the paper that you've written that I have a draft of is, is a powerful, uh, powerful contribution to the field. Well, thank you. All right. Take care. Thank you, John.